Hello, everybody. This is George N. Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And it is 1225 Central Time, and <laughs> I have our favorite guy on the line, <laughs> uh, Joseph. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, what exactly is Hermetica? The Hermetica? Well, it's it's a body of writings mm -hmm. that are in Latin and Greek. Yes. That most scholars tend to think were written sometime, oh, say, in the second or third century, um, because they, you know, the the Greek of of the Hermetic is Kini Greek. So in other words, it's the same kind of Greek that you'd see in the New Testament. So, and it has certain resemblances to um, to Gnostic systems that were found, you know, that were current at that in the second, third century. But there's been a recent body of scholarship, like I, I outlined in uh, Financial Vipers of Venice, uh -huh. that has been led by uh, uh, Gareth Fowden and a couple of other people, primarily Fowden at, at the University of Oxford. I think he's at Oxford. Don't quote me on that. That have suggested that there are indications that even though the texts themselves may date from that period, their contents are clearly some of the contents date to to ancient Egypt. In other words, scholarship has has kind of reversed uh, the opinion that used to prevail had prevailed really from Isaac the bomb in, in the 16th, pardon me, the 17th century, who overturned the idea that the Hermetica were actual ancient Egyptian writings that had simply been transcribed into Greek and Latin. Hmm. But modern scholarship is slowly kind of reversing that because of, of taking the Hermetic writings claims seriously. One, one thing people have to understand about that kind of tradition is, and, and it's particularly true within certain circles in, in the classical world, that authorship wasn't as important to them as ascribing the inspiration to certain concepts to the, what people considered their ultimate origin. Yes. So in other words, if you were in that tradition, you, you might be writing a book, but you describe it to the Egyptian god Tehuda because he was the inspiration for your ideas. So there's a different concept of authorship, and that's partly what what scholars, uh, Fountain and some others, are starting to take very seriously. And then there's details. There's little details in the Hermetica. Uh, I'm trying to think of one right off the top of my head, but I... I <laughs> failing to do so. But um, there's little details in the Hermetica that would not typically have been known by a second century Gnostic or Neoplatonist or anybody like that that would have only been known to someone that was very, very knowledgeable in ancient Egyptian religion. So there's yet another little indicator that some of these texts have contents that are very, very old. And I think that's the case. I mean, I certainly had, I have always adhered to the view. It's important for people to understand that the Hermetica claim to be uh, works of the wisdom god of Egypt, Tehuda. Yeah. You know, thrice great Hermes is, is the Greek uh, ascription for the Egyptian wisdom god. And that's a long, complicated story, too, because uh, when Alexander conquered Egypt um, and then left, you know, some of his generals behind to, to manage and govern the territory, they, in turn, and this was also true in, in Babylonia, where he left a general uh, behind, what they did was they then turned to the priests of the regions of the conquered regions and asked them to 
compose you know histories of the region in Greek. Uh -huh. So that's how you know that's how Manetho came about in Egypt. That's how uh, Berosus came about in, in uh, Mesopotamia, because basically they were writing, they were trying to summarize all of their you know temple archives and everything for for the local Greek generals, Macedonian generals. So part of part of the Hermetica come out of that that milieu where where you have a Greek population that is kind of gradually absorbing Egyptian religious concepts. There's some people that think that Neoplatonism comes out of that and I, I tend to think there's a case to be made to a certain extent for that. Um, but in the Renaissance, what's really important that people have to understand, none of this was known. In other words, they were confronted with texts that claimed to be the text of the wisdom god Tehuda. And they took that at face value. So in other words, the Renaissance humanists really thought they were reading texts that were older than the Old Testament, at least in terms of their contents. Um, and that's part of the reason you have that huge explosion of, of Hermeticism. But that, that, in, that in brief is, is what the Hermetica um, are. They're just a collection of texts. Um, and they're, you know, most of them are written in dialogue form. They're about philosophical things, cosmological things, ethics. Um, that's one part of the Hermetica. The other part of the Hermetica that doesn't usually see much translation um, are the texts that deal almost exclusively with magic, um, yeah. astrology, and, and things like that. Those texts. Uh, it's the philosophical ones that, that have been translated. The, the others really haven't been, to my knowledge, anyway. Um, well, why would that be, that the, the magical texts have been ignored? Well, they haven't been. There's magic in the philosophical texts, don't get me wrong. But, but what I'm talking about are the, the astrological things and, and you know, the, the hardcore stuff. Um, Largely, I think it's it's an effect of of the post Renaissance period when when you had the reaction in Europe against it. Um, I think that's probably a large part of it. Although you certainly see massive influence of of Hermetic doctrines by the time you get to Elizabethan England. I mean, there, Elizabethan literature is just shot through with Hermetic. Um, Hermetic themes. You find it in Spencer. You find certainly find it in, in Shakespeare, A.K.A. the, the Earl of Oxford. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which is which is where I stand on on the authorship question. But yeah, you find you find all sorts of Hermetic influences in, in Shakespeare's plays, particularly the later ones. Um, they're they're just really too hard to ignore. Wow. Well, can you? make an example of some of the magical information? Well, one of the things in, in the Hermetica um, that, is, that stands out very clearly is there's a famous passage where Tehuda is describing bringing statues to life uh -huh. through magic. Kind of like the golem? <laughs> kind of like the golem, yes. Um, not, not in quite the same sense, because in, in, in the Kabbalah, golem is, is, if I recall correctly, there's a, a procedure that you go through. It's lengthy, and, and a golem is, is not a statue. Um, this in the Hermetic is very explicit. They're, you know, they're talking about statues and, and bringing them to life. And that's an interesting text because you have in uh, the Middle Ages the tradition that Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas's kind of mentor, yes. uh, Albertus Magnus supposedly had one of these things, a talking head or a talking statue that, that he made and brought to life and so on. You find a reference to it um, and I wish I could think off, you know, I'm forgetting everything tonight. 
there there's a reference to these talking statues kind of obscure in one of Shakespeare's plays toward the end. I can't remember which one it is. I'm, I'm thinking Cymbeline, but that may be mistaken. Um, probably is mistaken. But there's a, there's a clear hermetic reference to that thing, kind of obscure in, in one of Shakespeare's plays. But I mean, when you get to Shakespeare, some of these some of the plays are so shot through with. Uh, hermetic imagery and themes and so on. It's, it's not really even funny. Um, okay. And once you, once you recognize that, then then the question becomes: Well, how does a semi-literate, uh, middle of middle income uh, fellow from Stratford on Avon who can barely scrawl his name? Yeah. <laughs> you know, where does he where does he learn hermetic doctrines that would require? Latin and Greek, and yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know. Darn right. uh, so you know, it, it, on that on that score alone, you've got a big problem for for authorship. Wow. But you find you find hermetic imagery, you know, the whole idea of the Virgin Queen. Well, you know, Spencer's play, or pardon me, Spencer's poem, The Fairy Queen, applies all of that imagery directly and and very consciously and very deliberately to to Queen Elizabeth. Oh, you know who was anything but a virgin, right? Um, but you know that was certainly the propaganda, and it was it was part of the hermetic politics of the age. Spencer Spencer has it, um, you know, and, and uh, Shakespeare has it. Um, you don't have to go very far, really, to to start encountering that stuff in, in the late Renaissance. Well, in the astrological text. Mm -hmm. uh, what would we find? Well, I've never read them. I don't even have them. Okay. Um, the, the, the version of the Hermetica I have is that big four-volume set that uh, Walter Scott translated back in the 19th century yeah. with copious introductory notes and so on. It's, you know, it's got the Greek text and the Latin text of, of the... Of the kind of the philosophical hermetic and that's that was the text that was first translated um, Cosimo de Medici caused that that series of texts to be translated and there like I say there's there's magical references even in in, in those texts although they're put into kind of a cosmological philosophical context well does Paracelsus fit in anywhere here? Oh yes! Oh heavens, yes! Par yes, absolutely. He, he made a homunculus. Well, he claimed to. Um, yeah. And I think he put the flask in a pile of dung to yes. keep it he, warm. No, that's not <laughs> <laughs> the the homunculus. If you read Paracelsian literature. Um, or some other alchemical text from that period will mm -hmm. talk about making a homunculus by... Uh, well, I don't want to be crude here. <laughs> There's no way other than to be crude. Mixing uh, the male issue with what they call putrefying dung. Ah, yeah. Um, that's, that's the reference. And then all of this is done in a flask. Um, you know, it's a very it's a very curious reference to find in alchemical texts because it's almost as if they're talking about um, in vitro fertilization, yes. test tube test tube babies, and so on. You know, and this is this is centuries before anything in science is even remotely close to being able to do that. Yeah. But Paris, Paracelsus definitely fits in because he's one of these people in the Renaissance that. And, and I had an email from somebody, uh, somebody that speaks French, just begging me to quit saying Renaissance. It's a bad habit I picked up in, in Britain, I guess, and <laughs> stuck with me. Um, I couldn't even begin to pronounce the word in French. Um, <laughs> my, oh French my French leaves a lot to be desired. But anyway, um, Paracelsus, like many of those people that were physicians during that period, were enamored of the idea that you find in the Hermetica of the cosmic harmony. Yeah. 
and because because man was a microcosm of the entire universe diseases were thought to be the effect of when the body got out of harmony so their approach to medicine was needless to say um, a little unorthodox <laughs> yeah. by, by modern standards yes. uh, but you know Paracelsus was certainly not the only physician that thought that Robert Flood in England was another yes. John D. you know all of those people are moving in these hermetic circles and pick up those hermetic doctrines so it, it had an enormous influence and, and one of the things I'm trying to show in, in this new book is that which I caution people I've said this many times to, to my website members I caution people it's a messy book because I'm trying to do history I'm trying to show cultural influence and do literary music criticism and theory and history conspiracy theory you know all of it at the same time which I don't know how successful I was <laughs> but, um, the problem that I'm trying to show in the book is really when you're looking at that time period of history you're really not dealing just with Protestantism and Roman Catholicism you're also dealing with Hermeticism yes. and it had an enormous influence within the Protestant world particularly within uh, Calvinist circles in Germany and, and England and it had an enormous influence within certain circles within the Roman Church as well um, mm -hmm. you know just just think of the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher <laughs> um, certainly certainly uh, hugely influenced by Hermeticism so there's there's three forces really contending for cultural supremacy at that time and ultimately I think Hermeticism wins um, you even find its influence on, on people like Descartes believe it or not um, and, and Leibniz and Newton so it had an enormous influence on, on the development of modern science well, and, and that's really the story. Wow. Well. Uh, since you mentioned that, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. That's hold okay. on to your, hold on to your thought. Um, Copernicus. It's interesting that, and I, I think I mentioned this in Financial Vipers of Venice. If I didn't, I should have. <laughs> 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 oh my. But um, Copernicus when he published his you know theory of, of planetary orbits you know heliocentrism he prefaced his treatise by a reference to the Hermetica uh -huh. so in other words you even have it influencing some of the scientific developments anyway I didn't mean to interrupt your question well with okay we know mm -hmm. that today they are building um, machines, and they are doing um, oh, all kinds of things between machines and people. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Joseph, could that have been what a golem was? It's possible. Um, you know, Doctor DeHart and I, when we wrote Transhumanism, we were we were really struggling to figure out a way how to present the phenomenon in a context that would make sense and mm -hmm. I forget which one of us it was it was either you know him or me that came up with the idea that what we were looking at was alchemy what we were looking at mm -hmm. was the attempt to to go back up the scale from from animal to, to vegetable to mineral to androgynous man yeah and at the, at the second level at the le level of mineral man well you know what is that really what are they doing when when they're coming up with combinations of machines and, and human beings or machines and, and other life forms they're they're really creating a kind of a cyborg they're creating mineral man so yeah you look at least in in the philosophical hermetic text you don't really see any of that yeah. um, 
you, you don't see this attempt to transcend the human condition by those kinds of crude technological means. Um, but on the other hand, you have to remember that when you get to people like John Dee and so on, oh, yeah. what they understood by magic in many cases, we would simply now today call special effects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, didn't John D? Isn't there? I've got his writings, um, mm -hmm. and they're very old. And in there, he describes something that looks exactly like a gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he in his in his Enochian magic in yes. his conjurations, he claimed to have seen some of these entities and for my for my from my point of view it's six of one half dozen of the other um, I don't have any problem with with viewing things like that as being spiritual manifestations I don't think they're necessarily good yeah um, but the other part of Dee's magic is is simply special effects you know using using the mechanical arts to create uh, a wonder um, that you would put into performance of a play or what have you. And we tend to think that we're the only engineering geniuses and so on, but, you know, the Emperor Rudolf II in Prague had little mechanical birds. Um, Prince uh, Prince Friedrich Wittelsbach in, in the Rhineland Palatinate at, at his castle at Heidelberg had mechanical lions, you know. this was This was all part of their hermetic understanding of magic um, using using technology to create magical effects so it's it's not all that unusual it's it's not new with Hollywood is what I'm trying to say well they, they're certainly coming up with a lot of uh, stuff you know well they 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 were extraordinarily creative uh, you know the Renaissance isn't called the Renaissance for nothing they were yeah. extraordinarily creative w what Joseph, why would the Renaissance be so creative, such a period of enlightenment, mm -hmm. and then it just kind of dwindles away, and there has never been something similar to it ever again? Well, it didn't dwindle away. <laughs> it, okay. it, was, it was quite literally murdered. Um, there were there were so many causes that hermeticism went back underground. It it never left the field. It just went back underground. Oh, because we'll murder you because you're practicing witchcraft type of thing well, in the church. Well, not so much of that. We'll get to that. Um, the first thing that killed hermeticism. Let's go back to what I said about Isaac Casabon in the okay. 17th century. He did an extraordinarily detailed philological study of the actual text, and he pointed out that there were certain Greek words, certain usages in the text that did not exist until after the, the books of the New Testament were written and composed. So in other words, his argument was these, these texts cannot possibly be as old as they claim, because the words simply didn't exist. Um, that basically was our, his argument. And that killed, or at least did serious damage to the claims of, of the Renaissance Hermeticists that, you know, they thought they were had rediscovered some ancient wisdom, and therefore they were coming up with these gigantic systems of, of trying to, to integrate Kabbalah and astrology and Hermeticism back into one unified system. And in addition to that, in many cases, they were trying to reconcile it with their Christian belief system. Yeah. So when Casabon did that, it really crippled that impulse. You know, you could no longer say that this was an ancient wisdom that we have to integrate back into our understanding of things. So that killed it in part. 
The other thing that killed it was, and I talk about this at some length in, in the new book, was there was an actual attempt mm -hmm. to found politics in Europe at the time yeah. on a hermetic basis. Uh -huh. You know, I talked about that with in Financial Vivers of Venice with Giordano Bruno and his idea that hermeticism would provide a new and truer religion that would be able to span and, if not ignore, the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. And if you'll recall, he made the claim that he wanted to start a secret society to spread those doctrines and and create a cultural revolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you had him saying this, but there were other political movements afoot, particularly in Germany, to do precisely the same thing. This is when the Rosicrucian manifestos come out, incidentally. Oh, and, yeah. You know, those are shot through with, with hermetic ideas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you had people, again, uh, Prince Friedrich in, in the Palatinate in Germany, the, the Rhineland Palatinate, was kind of maneuvered by hermetic forces into making some very disastrous political decisions that ultimately uh, cost him his crown. Um, and as a result of this, you have to remember that at this time, you have the Catholic Church going through the Counter-Reformation. Mm -hmm. So you have two factors to look at there. You've got the Council of Trent, which creates the Index of Forbidden Books, and then you have, yeah, you know, talk about thought police. Yeah. And then you have um, the Jesuit order, which was founded to basically to, to recapture Europe for Catholicism in a kind of a subversive way. So when the index is created, one of the sets of books that are first put on the index are any books having to deal with Hermeticism. Um, and even the Venetian Franciscan friar, Francesca Zorzi, some of his books fell under suspicion because of a heavy Hermetic influence. So that's the other thing that kills it. So you have, and with the Catholic counter-reaction, you had a similar counter-reaction in Protestant Europe against these doctrines as well. So there's a lot going on that that killed it in, to, in, in the public sense and forced it back underground. But the other thing you need to remember is that while that's taking place, you still have people like Descartes that are making some strange statements. Um, and incidentally, Descartes was with the Catholic army that triumphed over Prince Friedrich. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, what's he doing there? You know, why, why is this mathematician running off to join an army <laughs> to, to go combat Prince Friedrich? Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Stranger and stranger. Um, you have Newton, of course, with his heavy alchemical influence in, in Isaac Newton. And certainly it's there in, in my favorite of, of the three, which is Gottfried Leibniz. Um, uh, you, you really can't even read Leibniz's philosophy, his monadology, uh, without understanding that it's basically a rehash, a distillation, a kind of a boiling down to the quintessence, to use the alchemical phrase of, of hermetic philosophy and, and putting it and updating it in modern terms. So it's, it, it had an enormous influence. It was driven underground, but by the same token, there were too many people by that point of, of brilliant intellect that were taken with some of its doctrines and, and attempted to update them and put them in terms of, of their own philosophical language. It had an enormous influence. Well, if it went underground, mm -hmm. could that be where Germany has gotten a lot of its... Uh, weaponry, as it were? Well, I don't know that... Um, 
I don't know that it would it would connect directly to to the peculiar German habit to engineer weapons. Um, well, I'm talking about but very it did, special weapons. Well, I, it did have an enormous influence, I think, on uh, some intellectual circles in Germany. And again, I go back to Leibniz. What does Leibniz start doing and calling for almost immediately after the appearance of the Rosicrucian manifestos? Well, he, he tries to convince... Uh, the Habsburg monarchs in Vienna and various German princes. Uh, he tries to convince the, the kings of Prussia and so on to start effectively what are our modern-day scientific academies, royal academies. Mm -hmm. And he's modeling it. The important thing that people have to understand, he's modeling it on the basis of, of the Rosicrucian society. And you see a similar impulse at work in England, of course, with the royal society there because many of the people that are initially involved when, when King Charles II charters the Royal Society. You have both roundheads and, and royalists that are members of, of the Royal Society. And their their common uh, their common denominator in many cases is Masonry. So in other words you had some sort of secret society influence at work already. Okay. So I think what happens in Germany is that you did have with Agrippa and yeah. Johann Andrea Valentin and all of these people, and Paracelsus certainly, you certainly had an intellectual current in Germany of hermetic doctrines that found quite a nice home in Lutheranism because Lutheranism is kind of basically platonic in its outlook. And it could certainly find a home there to a certain extent. You have another influence going on in Germany uh, in in the 17th and 18th centuries with with the box, because most music theory treatises in Germany at that time were written in alchemical language. Yes. So in other words, when you're listening to their music, you're listening to kind of hermetic, alchemical music because what what that music is is it's transmutations of basic ideas over and over and over. Uh, some of them are extraordinarily subtle, but that's basically how they thought, you know. Um, I, I'm thinking if, if you listen to the third movement of, of J.S. Bach's um, harpsichord concerto for, for three harpsichords, there's a short little initial statement of about 14 measures. And then the entire rest of the piece is permutations of that 14 measures. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's just, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's like listening to, to um, it's like listening to a computer algorithm just run endless permutations of, of the same basic material. Wow. Um, so you're listening. You're listening to a hermetic influence in Germany. Um, by the time you get to Kant and, and uh, Hegel is another one. Hegel. Yes. Most people. Most people think of Hegel as you know just this horribly overcomplicated German idealistic philosopher, who you know perished the thought you'd ever have to read him in German. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bad enough in English, folks, but yeah. <laughs> in German, it's a real, it's a real slog. Um, but Hegel, what most people don't know about him is that he was very familiar with Hermetic texts. And again, if you know how to look for it, it shows up in his philosophy. So it had an enormous influence in Germany. Um, but that's not to say it didn't elsewhere. It certainly had an enormous influence in England. Um, it certainly had an influence in France. Uh, certainly Italy. It's, it's basically all over in Western Europe. Well, there was an article that came out the other day, and I wish I had saved it, mm -hmm. but I didn't. And it was complaining about outer space and the fact that we need to find a new physics. Mm -hmm. um, 
that really kind of threw me. <laughs> well, we do need to find a new physics. Yeah, we do. Um, personally. But I mean for them to publish that, you know. Well, this is this has been going on for quite some time. I mean, it's uh, there have been calls to find a new physics since World War II, if not before. Um, and I, I'm one of those that strongly suspects that there is a hidden physics in in the Black Project's world. Oh yeah. That is very different from what I call the public consumption physics. Yeah. Which to me. And I'm going to crawl way out onto the end of the twig here. Okay. Um, I, I don't need a bunch of angry physicists writing me letters. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm acknowledging that this is really, uh, this is really some high speculation. But to me, I, I, I tend to think that most modern physics that gets talked about in the public media is a physics that looks like it was deliberately designed to dead end, hmm. uh, to, to, lead, to lead to insoluble problems that yeah. have no practical application that, you know, we can engineer technologies mm -hmm. on, on the basis of this stuff. A lot of it looks that way to me. Okay. But hermeticism, you know, hermeticism, what hermeticism did, if you stop and think about it, with Copernicus, with Kepler and his idea of, of platonic solids being somehow related to the orbits and positions of planets, um, yeah. with Newton and his alchemical work um, and his kind of strange remarks that he has at the end of the Principia, um, when you look at when you look at these people, Hermeticism had an extraordinary influence on on the development of modern physics. Um, there, there, in my opinion, you wouldn't have modern physics without it. Wow! 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 Hmm. Well, is there a hidden body of uh, Hermetica that? has never been revealed, I wonder. Well, I don't know about that so much. I do think that if you read, let me put it this way, I think if you read the Hermetica, and, and I, I talk about this in, in some of my books, probably ad nauseum, so some of my readers are probably sick of me, uh, talking about it, but I point out in the Hermetica, it's very clear this this topological metaphor of the medium I, I yeah. keep talking about. It's very clear in the Hermetica, and when you look at that and understand that you're looking at possibly a mathematical metaphor of yeah. some sort, then yes, there's there's a physics there that is there in its bare bones outline. The problem is, and, and mathematicians will probably understand this a little better than, than the average layman, but the problem is if you start looking at that metaphor and expressing it in the language of topology, if you're going to claim that this is a physics, then you have to bridge the gap between topology and the kind of mathematics that, that physics is couched in. And that, to my knowledge, no one has done. There have been some stabs at it uh, by some Ukrainian physicists uh, and a, I think a French topologist. But it's nothing, it, it's nowhere near a form of final completeness. But that said, once you've said something like that, then you're saying, yeah, there's a, there's a hidden physics here of some sort. Um, wow. Oh. That, and, and again, you know, I point out in this book, I pointed it out in, in Dr. DeHart's and our, my little book about transhumanism in dialogue. Um, the problem is recognized by Newton and Descartes and Leibniz. Yeah. 
because what do they say? Let me see if I can find that okay. book, and I'll just read the quotation rather than give a paraphrase, because it's kind of interesting what they say. All right, I think it's page 22. Yeah, all right. Let me read this, all right? Okay. And this is a quotation now. And this is from Rene Descartes. Now, why is this quotation significant? Well, listen, quote, We see that the old geometers have made use of a kind of analysis which they extended to the solution of all problems, mm -hmm. albeit they have hidden it from posterity. Oh. I well realize that they must have known a kind of mathematics that was very different from today's common one. Uh -huh. Not that I think they knew it perfectly. And indeed, some traces of this true mathematics seem to me still to appear in Pappas, who, though not belonging to the most ancient ages, lived many centuries before our times. I would also think that later on, it was suppressed by its very authors because of a certain wicked slyness, unquote. Now, stop and think. Wow. Here's the inventor of analytic geometry, yeah. uh, the Cartesian coordinate system, which we still use. You know, the, this, <laughs> this is just bread and butter in, in mathematical physics. We still use this system. It's been modified, of course, but it's basically there. Yeah. Well, for Rene Descartes to come out and say, okay, what, what did he just say? He said there was an ancient form of mathematics, and we don't know what it is, and it was suppressed, okay? Who would suppress it? Who well... Would, I mean, in, in while we're speculating, who would be the group that would suppress this, Joseph? If there's a group at work doing it and mm -hmm. suppressing it, then I would suspect it's because they realize that there's possibly aspects of it that are very dangerous and should only be shared with people that can handle it. That well, would be my guess. Who would be the uh, can you, the group? The name of the group? It would be it would it well the group doesn't have a name. It would be people involved in hermetic studies, it would be people involved in alchemy and, and so on and so forth. Um, if there's a group, per se, then one of my suspicions would be the, the academy that was shut down by the Emperor Justinian in the East Roman Empire. Oh. Um, so in other words, it, it persists quite late, but within the West, I think you'd have to look at certain uh, families, you'd have to look at certain um, certain elements within within the the papal curia, mm -hmm. uh, with access to to the archives and so on and so forth. All right, now here's here's Newton. Listen to this. Okay. Quote: To be sure, the ancients' method is more elegant by far than the Cartesian one. For Descartes achieved the result by an algebraic calculus, which, when transfused into words following the practice of the ancients in their writings, would prove to be so tedious and entangled as to provoke nausea, nor might it be understood. <laughs> but they accomplished it by certain simple proportions, judging that nothing written in a different style was worthy to be read, and in consequence, concealing the analysis by which they found their construction. Uh -huh. okay. wow. So again, Newton, all right, you yeah. know, here's here's one of the inventors of, of the integral calculus. Mm -hmm. And one of the first scientists to to rigorously apply mathematics to, to physical problems. Yeah. And he's saying the same thing that Descartes is. There's some hidden form of analysis that appears to have been known to the ancients and this was concealed. <laughs> okay? Well, when they right. say the ancients, 
are they talking about the Sumerians? Are they do, who are well they? in new, in in both of their cases, they're most likely talking about the geometers, Euclid and so on and so forth. Oh, okay. But you have to remember, however, that Newton is different in this respect in that he did study some of the early mathematical studies of the Great Pyramid. Yeah. So, you know, he could be talking about not only the the Greek geometrical tradition, but he may be talking about the Pythagoreans, he may be talking about the Egyptians, you know. It's always it's always difficult to figure out Newton. All right, now listen to this. This is the third one, and this is my favorite. This is by Leibniz. All right, now again, remember who Leibniz is. He's the other inventor of the modern calculus. Okay. He invented it independently of Newton, although later than Newton. But he was, in my opinion, more thorough because we still use we still use Leibniz's notations in our calculus. We don't use Newton's. We use Leibniz's because it's much more elegant and it's simpler. And the reason is that Leibniz gave a great deal of thought to how to symbolize things. Okay? Here it is. Quote, The ancients seem to have recognized and possessed such an analysis proper to geometry for in their works, I think I can make out some vestiges of it, namely of an algebra in which numbers are not the issue. Certainly it is by this art that they unfolded those propositions, otherwise we would not have had them for such a long time, which only with difficulty would we find by using our modern methods. I think I've attained and discovered the foundation and first liniments of this art with which, once we have found the right symbols and established some principles, we can obtain everything else by an imitation of calculating and with no need to follow the lines with our imagination, a result which I'm not sure even the ancients have ever attained." Unquote. Wow. So again, again, you have one of the three great mathematicians of that age yeah. saying there used to be a form of analysis that we no longer have, that it had a formal calculus or algebra by which they did these things, and it has nothing to do with numbers. <laughs> wow. Nothing so, to do with numbers. You know, yeah, and so in wow. other words, you know, all three are saying the same thing, an ancient form of analysis which has been lost or suppressed. Yeah. Um, and you know these these gentlemen invented some of our modern mathemat- mathematical languages well they they aren't giving us a clue as to where they're reading these things or why they're saying these things but um, I tend to think that they probably started noticing s- similar things in ancient texts to, to what I've been calling the topological metaphor in, in some of these philosophical, metaphysical texts and, and uh, ancient lore and so on and so forth. Well, could some of these things have come out of uh, Constantinople when the Vatican uh, raised hell, <laughs> you know? I well, mean, there were a lot of manuscripts and things. Oh, yes. I, I do think, I do think that Constantinople is the hidden source of a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> I, I'm not so certain about um, this specific thing, in other words, a hidden form of analysis. But that said, when Cosimo de' Medici sends out Ficino, his, his kind of philosophical text hunter-gatherer, if you will, mm-hmm. um, the story is is that the, the manuscripts of the Hermetica were found by through contact with Constantinople. Oh my goodness! Um, and again, I, I personally think that that the Fourth Crusade uh, that Venice probably engineered to, to sack Constantinople right from the start. Yeah. Um, I tend to think that the whole purpose of that crusade was 
not only to install a, a Venetian puppet in, in Byzantium, which they certainly did, mm -hmm. but simply to gain access to the imperial archives and whatever was there. I think in Venice's case, it's clear what they were looking for. They were looking for maps, oh, and, I, and I think they found them. Yeah. Um, but yes, there, there could be all sorts of things hidden in Constantinople. Um, it clearly, clearly the Hermetica were known to some people in the East, East Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and word somehow leaked out to Cosimo de' Medici. So, yeah, I think, I think Constantinople is a huge source of this. And whenever you're saying archives of Constantinople, you have to remember that up until about the mid 7th century, about 64 AD, I think it was, <clears throat> when Egypt finally fell, uh, first to the Persians and then a couple of years later to, to the Arabs. Um, Egypt, for that whole period up to then, had remained a province of the East Roman Empire. So in other words, you know, those emperors in Constantinople have pretty much access to anything that's down there in Egypt. Mm. Well, wh where Emperors we... being emperors, they may have had you know, some people trying to translate all of that stuff into Greek. Wouldn't some of the original scrolls be in the Vatican archive? Possibly, yes. Oh Possibly. Boy. Oh, oh. oh Possibly. my gosh. It would yeah, be it's, it's, a wet dream to have access to those archives. Oh, yeah, if, if, if even, you know, if if even the Vatican archivist knows they're there. I mean, they're so the archives yeah. are so huge. huge. But, um, yeah. but, you know, the other possibility that you're dealing with, and I definitely think this is a possibility that one has to contend with, is family tradition. Um, and uh, people will see what I'm getting at once once they read the new book, because it's very clear that there are families in Europe that preserve some sort of tradition of some hidden knowledge independently of, of access to any of those archives. Yeah. Wow. Oh, boy. Ooh, it just gets deeper and deeper and It deeper. is a very, very deep story. It's a very deep story. It's very complex. And it, the sad thing about the story is it does require you to read between the lines and yeah. to draw some reasonable conjecture on the yeah. basis of what's there in the lines. But I think um, I, I think I at least managed to do that to some extent in the new book. Can we may we pause this briefly? Yes, I have to let um, Dottie in anyway. All so right. we'll pause. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, do these <laughs> Joseph? The IQ of the human race mm -hmm. together seems to be going down. Physical health seems to be going down. Mm -hmm. um, male sperm is at a premium now. Uh, mm -hmm. Women, you know... <laughs> There is something happening to the whole human race. Mm -hmm. What? How? How do you see that? What? What's going on? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. I think. Um, I think as far as as the declining intellectual powers I oh, yeah. I would hesitate I would hesitate to say that of, of the whole human race I think what's really happening is you're seeing a definite decline in the West and particularly in in the United States yes. simply because the powers that be have been so successful in dumbing down the the education curricula in this country oh, yeah. uh, and capturing it and and nationalizing it and and uh, running their social engineering experiments through it. I think that's largely to blame uh, for what we see going on in, in the West. And it's happening in the West as other countries adopt the American model of, of education. Oh, 
Yeah, that's that's not a you know not a good thing to do. Um, as far as the declining health, I think the picture could be related to the fact that we've seen so much of the commercialization of agriculture and the move away from natural organic methods of, of farming, particularly in this country with, with GMOs. Um, yeah. I think I think the health benefits of, of GMOs are questionable oh, yeah. given, given some of the scientific papers that have begun to come out lately. Joseph. They, they are screwing with our apples. Do well, you they're, know, they're, the yeah, EU, they're messing around with everything. <laughs> yeah, the EU is refusing any apples grown in this country because yeah, there's a, a, a chemical that they're using on the apples that definitely causes cancer. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, oh. I think, you know, I, I think that... This has to be there. There has to be a factor of of the industrial age that has affected human health over the long term. Yes, I, I think too. You know, and again, I, there's as far as I know, there's no there's no good evidence for the speculation I'm about to offer. But the spraying, I think, too. Yeah. Has something to do with it. Um, Chemtrails. Yeah, you you can't you cannot be spraying heavy compounds into the air and not have it affect human health and, and particularly reproductive health. Yeah. So, um, I think it's a complex series of factors that, that we're looking at, well, and I think some of it's being done deliberately too. I think. Uh, yeah. I, I don't put it past the powers that be to try and engineer their population decrease by soft means. Yes. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't think they'll ever succeed with the dystopian, I shouldn't say utopian, but dystopian goal of, of dumbing everybody down because, you know, you can't have too many dumb people, otherwise airplanes are going to start falling out of the sky and elevators are going to start crashing to the ground. And yeah. At, at some point you have to have a capable technocracy that, that can keep things running. Oh, boy. Wow. Well, it just seems to me that people are not as bright as they once were well, no, they aren't. <laughs> I know. They aren't. Go ahead. It's, it's, the, it, it's, it's the other effect of, of education is partly due to our culture. It's, it's much easier to text and play video games yeah. than to crack a book. Yep. Um, that's part of the people, problem. People, yes, that is a huge part of the problem. I ran into it constantly back when I was teaching in college, is the inability that I encountered of people to be able to think critically and connect dots and draw out implications of the dots once they were connected. Um, it's, 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 being, it's being almost totally excised from the system. Every now and then you find a teacher here, a teacher there in the system that uh, comes along and, and creates a ruckus because they're saying what's obvious. Um, yeah. The system, the system isn't working. That's right. And we're, we're raising a generation of idiots, yep. by and large. That's right. And You know, when I was in high school, George Ann, in my world literature class, <coughs> this was my junior year, we had we had to read gobs of stuff, but I remember one of the things that we had to read in one semester was Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Yeah, now, oh, yeah. Know, if you've ever sat down and read a Russian novel, you know oh. <laughs> you're yes. in for a slog. And don't get me wrong, I like Dostoevsky, but um, you know it was that and some Shakespeare plays and mm -hmm. just all sorts of stuff. And uh, now. <sighs> I, you know, it, it's it's hard to find a teacher, occasionally you do, that's willing to assign literature like that at a high school level. 
Hmm. Boy, well, whatever it is, Joseph, we're in a lot of trouble. The younger, yes, we are. The younger generation are just into themselves and... Um, <laughs> some are, some aren't. You um, know. Some are, some aren't. Hmm. Well, it's it's disturbing. <laughs> it's very disturbing. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. And I do praise teachers that actually teach children. Um, well, they they are swimming upstream. And, yes. You know, I know a couple of them, and um, they're swimming upstream, and it's a constant battle. Yes. Because they, they literally have to be subversives within the system to do it. Mm-hmm. Consciously, deliberately. Yes, uh, I know. And, uh, you know, this has to be tied to a plan, you know. Uh, and, and you see so many people, Joseph, and the thought occurs to me, they don't have a future. There's no future. Well, it's been engineered that way, partly. I mean, yeah. look at people. College tuition is skyrocketing in this country. Yes. And the jobs aren't there once you get done with your hundreds of thousands of dollars of indebtedness. Um, that's another problem. And, and uh, you know, I, I look at this and I, I see Byzantium all over again, yeah. you know, rolling in wealth and, and trying to survive on the basis of covert ops and geopolitical manipulations. Well, you know, it didn't work out too well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not and working Sultan out now it, either. <laughs> well, it's not working out now either. Um, yeah. At some point, at some point, I think people are going to have to realize that, that true education has got to become subversive. and. People have to take responsibility to educate themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and to to know what to know what the Western cultural canon. There's that horrible phrase again. To know what it is and and to understand it and be able to pass it on. And I'm yes. not talking cultural canon in the sense of you know conservative Republicans or liberal Democrats. I'm not uh, I'm not talking about that at all. How do we get rid of them? <laughs> I'm serious. Trust they, me, I've exercised my mind. <laughs> Joseph, they are parasites. Both parties are parasites. Well, I know. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I, I Again, I think... <laughs> I, I don't think our, our problems are political. I think they're spiritual and cultural. Oh, yes. They are spiritual. And... That's why I say I, I think you have to take responsibility. <coughs> pardon me to learn the canon and expose yourself to it and understand it and pass it on. Mm. Um, as as for <coughs> pardon me, the two political parties or the two halves of the one political party. Um, you know, neither one of them have met a, a government program. Or, or state a solution that they don't like. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <coughs> and some of these so-called um, solutions were written 20 years ago. Well, longer than that. I mean, you know, there's there's always been there's always been a a cultural critique going on in this country, but it just doesn't seem to get much traction. Um, and it, it won't so long as, as people keep turning on the major media. Yeah. Um, Agreed. And, and deriving their information from that. Um, oh. Because all of that all that does is to polarize things into the false oppositions that we're all too familiar with. Boy, you can say that again. Oh. Well, uh, you know... We've got people coming out and saying uh, that the government is arming the, the police for, um, you know, uh, civil breakdown in this country. Mm -hmm. No, no, Spanky. 
Vicky! No, no. Oh, dear. <laughs> no. But, it, 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 you know, there's just this craziness that's going on. Well, part of the craziness, if I may, people have to turn off the conspiracy theory mongering. Um, and and this, this constant focus on fear and apocalyptic yeah. doom and government conspiracies and banker conspiracies and corporate conspiracies. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a place for, for commentary on all of that, of course, but this is why I say that the real work lies in preserving our culture. Because if anything like that does happen, the only thing worth preserving are those elements of that long tradition that are good. Yes. Um, so, again, you know, we're, we're back to square one. Uh, I, I don't... I, I certainly look at what's going on in the world and in the West in particular, and just sometimes it boggles my mind at how counterintuitive it all is. Oh, yeah. Um, and you get you get the typical analyses of various people on various internet sites. Well, this is all part of their plan, and they're using Hegel's dialectic, you know, to create chaos and propose solutions. You know, we we know the script. Yeah. And <laughs> that may well be, but you know, the problem with that kind of thinking is you are never completely in control of events. And mm -hmm. if that's what they're up to, and they roll the chaos dice, they may end up with real chaos that they yeah. cannot control. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? um, if that, again, if that happens, what are you going to do to create some sanity and some order in your little pocket of the world? Well, that's the culture part again. Yep. Well, hmm. what what do you see as culture in in this country? Well, this country doesn't really have a culture. It does not have a high culture. That's right. Um, musically, there there are some groups and people out there, but they're not part of the big corporate art media. Right. Um, they're doing creative things below the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a high culture, you know, we're in a culture that, that can lionize Rembrandt and Jackson Pollock in one breath. Yeah. Oh. In other words, the United States American culture is a leveling culture. And that's not a culture, because a culture, in my opinion, has to have a hierarchy of values, be yes. it in aesthetics or, or what have you. Um, when you don't have that, then everything becomes equal, and everything becomes just as plausible of an aesthetic expression and worthy of the, of the attribution genius as anything else, and of course that's nonsense. Right. Um, and the same thing with literature, um, all of it. I don't think America has ever had that. Uh, it's had some significant stabs at it, but um, most of what we get is, is kind of secondhand borrowed European culture. Yeah, we don't have any great hermeticists or... We don't, yeah, we don't have... <laughs> we don't have... A, we don't have um, a very good high philosophical tradition, there are some literary lights here and there, um, but it's, it's few and far between. Boy, you can say that again. Oh, my goodness, Joseph. Yikes. Well, something I want to ask you about You, you've heard <coughs> of, uh, excuse me, of P. 
people who have been abducted. Yes. And they come back and they have scoop marks and scars yes. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really know how to put this into words, but in the Bible, in the Gospels, it says, as above, so below. An old, old, old occult axiom. axiom. It doesn't say exactly that. Yeah. I understand what you're, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. If they have the technology to suck the soul out of a human being, mm -hmm. which would be a carbon copy of the human being, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they did experiments on it mm -hmm. and then placed it back in the body, mm -hmm the body would surely show evidence of that. Is, is, does that have any merit? Well, there are lots of people that think that there is a spiritual agenda to the abduction phenomenon. I, I happen to be in that camp. Yeah. Um, I don't think that most of it is very good, yeah. quite frankly. Right. But would that show up in a physiological fashion somehow? I don't know. Um, I do think that there has been a major attempt within the Black Project's world to understand what we call the soul. Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, I think the hallmark of the Black Project's world, the cosmological hallmark of that world, is that it is not materialistic in its cosmology. In other words, it does not believe that everything can be explained, human emotions, human actions, human will, human intention, yeah. can be explained simply as chemical processes in the brain. You right. know, um, in fact, long ago, in, a ser in one of our er very earlier talks, I said that there's three secrets that I think the elites hold mm -hmm. and the first is that they know that God exists not as a matter of faith but as a matter, but of, as a matter of a formally explicit proposition Wow! and secondly that they believe that the soul that human personal immortality is real not again not as a matter of belief but as a matter of fact mm. as a matter of formally explicit proposition yes so I suspect that within the black projects world you have at some very deep and high level a group that knows and is acting on these things in order to flesh out their knowledge more fully. Mm -hmm. And there have been people that have suggested that many abduction phenomena have all the hallmarks of human psychological operations and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that I think that's always the case, but right. many of them do. Right. So, you know, Jacques Vallée was one of those that, that thought that. Um, there's another author out there, I forget what his name is, that, that wrote a whole book on that thesis. So, yeah, I think there's an aspect in the Black Projects world that's not just concerned with technologies like anti-gravity and what have you. I think there's a group that's concerned with technologies of the soul and mind and, and consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, 
for want of a better word, occult technologies. Yes. Um, and I mean, I mean occult, not in the sense simply of of something evil, but occult in the sense of something hidden. Yes. Uh, something not accessible to most people. Um, I, I definitely think that I have for a long, long time. <clears throat> wow. Well, I agree with you on that take that you have on that topic. Oh my gosh, it's really breathtaking when you think about it. Yes. And all the implications that go with yes. it. My yes. Gosh. Um, well, to give you an example, you know, Peter Lavenda, you've had him on your yes. program. He's, he's very strongly suggested this in, in, his, in his books. Um, Nick Redfern wrote a book about this aspect of, of Black Projects research. I don't recall what the title was, but it was very interesting. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's evidence there. Um, there's another book by a fellow by the name of S.K. Bain, B-A-I-N, that's called The Most Dangerous Book in the World, and it's about an occult examination of 9-11. In other words, examining the whole event solely from, mm. the, from the perspective of, of ceremonial magic. Oh, and it's, it's an eye-opener. I mean, you, you can't come away from that book without the definite uh, impression that he's on to something yeah. and it's huge. So yeah, I think I think all the signs are there that you have elites that definitely have this non-materialistic consciousness cosmology and they're using all the old familiar techniques to, to pursue it. Um, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. And we, we see another indicator of it in the remote viewing program that yes. took place in this country for so long. Well, you know, it was it was underway for at least a full decade before anybody talked about it publicly. It was a highly classified program. It involved psychics, you know, Ingo Swan was involved with it. Yes. But it it also involved theoretical physicists, you know, Hal Putoff and, and Russell Targ. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's again a clear indicator that they are very serious and intent about that. And that's just this country. Similar uh, similar research was conducted in the Soviet Union and is probably still going on yeah. inside of Russia. Uh, and again, that's not very well known, but it, it occurred. It happened. So they're, they're definitely investigating this stuff. The Chinese right now are investigating it. Um, and I, I forget the guy's name. I, I read a paper from someone at Edwards Air Force Base outlining his research into their secret psychic research, you know. So uh -huh. it's definitely going on. <clears throat> well, you have said that you believe that consciousness is not local. Right. I tend to believe that also. Right. Um, and in saying that, um, people who are hardcore fundamentalists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of whatever religion, mm -hmm. be it Christian or, or Muslim or mm -hmm. uh, Zionist or whatever, mm -hmm. um, when they pronounce something that is shocking to the rest of us, like, um, go kill all those people, you know, right. Uh, right. go stone them to death, right. this kind of brutish attitude, mm -hmm. does that shock the medium or... How, how does that fall on the medium? 
I think it could. Um, I think I think the real purpose of many of those statements coming out of fundamentalists. I don't I don't ascribe to most of those people enough sophistication. Yeah. To have the idea of shocking the medium, but certainly certainly they say these things to accomplish power over people. In other words, they're they're engaging in in social engineering. Yeah. But consciousness being non-local when i when i use that expression what i mean by it is that our individual consciousness our mind so to speak is not locked up inside our body it's not all in our head it's not all yeah it's not all in our head it's not all in inside it's uh outside so to speak yeah. um the biologist Rupert Sheldrake has books full of, of this idea and how he's been trying to run experiments to determine this. Um, and he uses the example of a species of monkey that exists on two isolated islands from each other. And the population on one island will learn a certain trick or a certain tactic and it'll be almost instantaneously picked up by the population on the other island with which it has absolutely no physical connection. Okay. Wow. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, things like this happen all the time. Probably we're familiar with it in, from examples in our own lives. And that's kind of what I mean. We have, and this again is what was discovered with the remote viewing uh, projects. Um, for some reason, humans have the capability to access information simply by thinking about it. Well, wouldn't they be accessing what Casey called the Akashic uh, yeah, that's records? Exa yes, they, that's exactly what I think is happening, and that's exactly what some of the people that were involved with it are proposing in their scientific papers. Um, you know, the Akashic records, what what they really are, are simply information in the medium. That's that's what they are. Yeah. And, you know, I've said many times that if you start looking at this ancient hermetic influence, that this cosmology that you see in the Hermetica, what it's talking about is precisely that. It's talking about the physical medium as an information field. Wow. Yeah. And that's a very modern conception. Uh -huh. So, you know, what's it doing in ancient Greek texts that are claiming provenance to Egypt? Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeez. in Egypt, of course, you have the idea of mat, yeah. which, is, which is basically information content in the field. That's what it is. M-A-A-T. M-A-A-T, right. Right. Um, so... It's, it, to me, I think all the indicators are there that you're dealing with something way back when that was extraordinarily sophisticated and residues of it got passed down through the ages and it's only now beginning to make a little sense as our own science advances again to, to a similar level of development. So, um, Well, are, is our science advancing to the level of what we're... Um, the Anunnaki that were here? It's getting mighty close, I think, yes. Oh, boy. I think it's getting mighty close. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. What, you know, what is the power of the gods? You know, when, when we think of, of supernatural powers, what are yeah. we thinking of? We're thinking of the ability to literally create to, to manipulate the medium in such a way that you can create, to manipulate time, it's time and space itself. Mm -hmm. Well, you can go to, to the website phys.org, P-H-Y-S.org, and just do a little search on their website of the phrase temporal cloaking. Yeah. And you'll pull up any number of little articles about experiments that scientists are running around the world to cloak little events oh. from the stream of time. 
Wow. In other words, to remove something from the causal flow of things. Oh. Now, folks, you know, like it or not, when you can, when you are saying that you're doing that kind of engineering on the laboratory bench, you are engaging in the engineering of the fabric of space-time. That's godlike. Yes, it is. That is that is godlike. It may be on a small scale right now. But, you know, science never sits still. Right. And well, what's on a small scale today may be in 10 to 100 years on an enormous scale. Well, um, Joseph, I think I, go, go ahead, honey. Go ahead. Well, I think, I, uh, you know, I uh, personally, I, I, I have thoughts along these lines I've never shared with people publicly because they think I'm nuts. But um, basically and briefly, I think it may have already been done on a very big scale. Uh huh. Um, like because well, let me let me just throw out a couple tantalizing clues. Okay. If you believe that some sort of practical anti gravity technology exists, yeah. That same technology by the nature of the case, is a technology that is playing around with the fabric of space-time on a big scale. Mm. And that could have repercussions. That like a jumbo jet type thing? <laughs> no, I'm not even talking about that. Okay. I'm, just talking, I'm just talking in general. Okay. Um, it, it, could have some, it could have some very interesting repercussions, and I'm not even going to go there. Again, people will think I'm nuts, but... Uh, Certainly, certainly, there are any number of articles and papers about scientists that have claimed uh, anti-gravity effects for some of their devices. And if that be the case, you know, they were making these claims incidentally in the 1950s. Well, <laughs> track it out till now. Um, yeah. It could be very big stuff that they're playing with. Um, and we can only hope that they have all of their equations nailed down. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Oh, yeah. boy. Well, some time ago, years ago, I did an interview with someone that claimed that in the Bible, mm -hmm. that, and I'm paraphrasing, that it states that there will be a whole country that will be made to disappear. Um, that seems to be like something that you're talking about. Well, it may be. You know, I don't know where they're talking about, and you get all sorts of people that are reading the tea leaves of their biblical prophecy. Yeah. Frankly, I just I, I just get so weary of it. Uh, <laughs> I just don't go there. Um, I get emails from people like that all the time. You are dealing with an extraordinary technology that at least has godlike potential in some of these cases. And that is profoundly disturbing. What I find more disturbing is that from my research, I think this technology has been going on for a long time, you know, the Nazi bell and other stuff. Yeah. The real question I have is why are they talking about things like this now yeah. in the open literature? Yeah. And Ooh. to me that means to me that means that they're starting very gradually to prep the world for huge cultural changes. I mean, things that are going to make the last two to three thousand years of human history look like child's play. Yeah. Um, oh. We'll go back to the Tower of Babel. <laughs> well, you know, uh, that was the whole theme of a couple of my more recent books, the, the Covert Wars books. Mm -hmm. And I do think that humanity in World War II right about the middle of World War II, entered that Tower of Babel moment 
um, and it's we're still in it. Um, oh my! But uh, yeah, it's it's a dangerous period of, of human history. I think I think the powers that be have been successful in staving off any potential intervention, so to speak. <laughs> oh boy. Oof. But they're playing they're playing a very dangerous game. Yeah. In order to do it. Mm. And you're not talking about any particular government. No. No, I'm not. I'm not. Just private people. I I think there's definitely a a breakaway civilization, like Richard Dolan says. Yeah. Um, I, I think there is such a group. Um, in other words, it's not just an informal thing. It's 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 a formal structure. It's kind of it's kind of like my Nazi international. It's kind of an extraterritorial state. Mm. Um, I I definitely think that they have been up to quite a few things since the end of World War Two. Well, and that much, much of what we, much that doesn't make sense if we analyze it on normal parameters, like mm -hmm. the financial markets. I mean, my word, yeah. IBM just lost China and, you know, their stock goes up. Yeah. Um, you know, th this is not a market if, if this happens. It's, it's theater. Yeah. Well, why... Why do we have the non-responsiveness of the government? Well, I think it's in part because if you establish this huge black budget at the end of World War II and it's still going on and everything has been poured into it, well, then that means that the public face of government is really just a harvesting mechanism to keep all these black projects going. That's why we have the non-responsiveness of government. That we yeah. And we have um, all this damned austerity going on. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff uh, that begins to make a little bit more sense once you factor in UFOs and hidden system of finance and potential threats therefrom and, and all of this stuff. Then then the picture changes, and it's it's a very different picture than, than what we get on... MSNBC on, oh, yeah. on the nightly, you know, on the <laughs> nightly news. That's right. Uh, and it's certainly going to be different than what you get on Faux News and Bill O'Reilly, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, who, who can't make up his name, his his mind whether or not Kennedy was assassinated by a conspiracy or not. You know, <sighs> before he became a big media name, you know, he was all for it, and now he's not. So yeah. come on, <laughs> changed my mind. Oh boy. Yeah, you know. All of this, all of this is, there's a hidden factor at play in the world, and it's it's known, I think, to the powers that be. They just can't let anyone else in on it right now. Well, those of us who live through whatever is going to happen, will we know what it is? Or can, I think we, can, can we tap into the Akashic Records and find well, out? Well, well, some people can, but I think I think they're putting into to play now the technologies they, they realize they cannot continue to keep suppressing this stuff. Yeah. They're putting it into play now. And they're having to do it in such a way that they can maintain their grip on it. And, you know, that, that good luck with that. But Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's 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 a lot happening right now. Uh, you know, NASA just came out with their little article and, and cutesy, cute Star Trek type diagram of of their warp drive ship, and you know, yeah, all of this stuff is going on. Um, they're building that big fusion reactor over in France, and, mm -hmm. and all of this stuff is going on, and. Do you ever hear of Pons and Flashman, their names? You never hear of them, but cold fusion is not the fringe thing that it was even right. 10 years ago. And, and the reason why 
is that there is a theory that is acceptable to scientists that can explain some of the phenomena. It's called lattice-assisted nuclear reaction, or sometimes low-energy nuclear reaction. But I prefer the first term because it's more accurate, and it gives you some idea of what the explanatory mechanism is. Uh, what it's saying, essentially, is that this is being accomplished by reaction with the lattice structure, which, again, you know, that was what Ronald Richter was saying down in Argentina in a different way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's something that makes sense to me. And, and you've got people now involved in the field, you know, Andrea Rossi in, in Italy and some other people. Yeah. Uh, you know, MIT is now holding and hosting conferences on cold fusion. So this is a huge change from where we were back in... in the first Bush administration when Pons and Fleischmann first announced their results. It's a huge change. Well, I know that they went to France. They went to France, yes. yeah. They eventually went to France. Um, but my point here is it's these things are changing. Um, and these technologies are coming down the pike, whether the elite wants to recognize this or not. And I think they finally woke up and, and have admitted that, that this is happening and there's there's no putting the genie back into the bottle. Yeah. Um, Thank God. <laughs> I think this is partly why they're in the hurry to put in their global government because yes. they want to make awful sure that this stuff doesn't fall into the wrong hands. And I don't blame them, you know, quite frankly. And that doesn't mean I'm in, all in favor of global government, but... I do understand their reasoning um, mm -hmm. and why they would why they would be concerned about these technologies. So um, <laughs> it's coming down the pike, whether we like it or not, uh, and it's going to it, 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 it is it is going to transform human society and culture in ways that will make the steam engine and the automobile and airplane and personal computers and internet look like child's play. Yeah, well, you know, they've got that uh, flying aqua board that people can, <laughs> that, well, I, that video was awesome. Yeah, I saw that, and, and, and after having been burned on the, on the Back to the Future hoverboard, I'm, I'm not even going to go there. Well, it, I, that looked like a whole lot of fun and if I were 30 years well, sure. younger I'd want one <laughs> Sure. and they've got cars that skim along the earth they don't have wheels they don't use gas um, they've got some marvelous technology yeah there you know there's no doubt in my mind that they have that these technologies have been around for a while um, the question the question is how are they going to let them out um, yeah. that that's going to be the big question um, it's it's going to happen whether they whether they like it or not <laughs> mm. well di didn't uh, the owners of the tesla car patent uh, didn't they make their patent public yes that's what I've heard. I mean, I don't know, but yeah. I've heard that they have. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Just too awesome. My gosh, Joseph. Yeah. In a hundred years, you know, our children and grandchildren are going to be in a very different world. Oh, yeah. One way or the other, you know, one way or the other. Yeah. Some of them will be living on Mars. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. Yikes. Oh, my gosh. Well, I've wondered many, many times, um, all, so many missing people, missing children, if they could be taking them to Mars. Well, I, I've, I've wondered about all the missing scientists and missing people and, and mm -hmm. what's really going on. Um, you know, there's there's no there's no all explanatory model right. for any of it. That that's the problem. 
um, you know, the idea of kidnapping people and, and taking them off planet, that's been around since that, that uh, 1970s British television thing called Alternative 3, which yeah. is a big April Fool's joke, as it turned <laughs> out. But, you know, that, that was the whole theme of the, of the show. Well, it may not but, be an April Fool's joke. <laughs> well, that was the thing. You know, I wrote about that in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, and mm -hmm. uh, the producers of that show, they eventually cobbled together a book from the show, and then one of the producers, I forget what his name was, um, later complained that he was being followed around by, you know, intelligence services, his phones were being tapped, and so on and so forth. Oh. Um, you know, and his explanation was maybe we maybe we got much closer to the truth in our silly little April Fool's joke than we even realized. Yeah. And that could be, you know. Um, I certainly think I certainly think there was there were some aspects to their program that were very close to the truth. Um, one of the things I remember very clearly from that program was that uh, they staged a fake interview with a British professor of, of international relations. And this gentleman, you know, in the script, he says that, you know, it has many of us curious. There's a certain phenomenon that looks like at some very high secret level, there's a degree of coordination between the American and Soviet space programs in spite of the public posturing of the space race. Yeah. And, you know, he kind of leaves it at that. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you look at what I pointed out in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, uh, you look at the launch schedules of Soviet and American probes, mm -hmm. and it's very curious. Uh, you can interpret it two ways. You can interpret it as, well, they're racing to outdo each other, or they're coordinating their launches with each other. Yeah, I think the Russians would launch a few. Well, the Russians would launch a few probes, and the Americans would launch a few probes, and back to the Russians, launching a few more. If you say probes, pardon me, if you say coordination, then you have to have a mechanism to do the coordinating. So the yeah. question then becomes, well, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. you know, and, and the only thing that I could conclude in the book is the only, the only organization with a presence both inside the Soviet Union and the, United, and the West was General Galen's outfit, his his intelligence organization yeah. that was left over from World War II. Oof. So, you know, that raises all sorts of nasty questions. Yeah. Um, so, could it be? I, yeah, sure. I, I do think that there's an element of in all of these missing children that is, is also very dark and very occult. Uh, I think they're using them for, for some very bad um, evil rituals and, and things. Uh, and and sex slavery and, and yeah. all of that horrible stuff. Um, yeah. I think that's going on too. Mm. So you know, I don't have I don't have one all-encompassing explanation for it. You know, even uh, some of the veterans have been, you know, killed, and mm. when they get the bodies back here. They're missing organs. Seems like there's a little organ harvesting going on. Well, if that's the case, then they're they're looking for, you know, they're doing pathology for a reason. Um, maybe because they were exposed to something that they don't want anyone to find out, or they're exposed yeah. to something that they're concerned about. You know, I I don't know. Sure, I don't know. weird. There's so many weird things going There's on. There's a lot of weird things going yeah. on. There's no doubt, and um, I think the bottom line is it all adds up to to the powers that be know that something is going on, and they have to move secretly in, in handling it uh, for whatever reason. Mm. Boy, oh Joseph. Tell us about the conference real quick. Oh, um, yeah, I've got a conference, not this weekend, but the next weekend, last weekend of June. It's called the Secret Space uh, Program Conference. And I'll be speaking there with a lot of interesting people. Uh, Richard Dolan will be speaking, and uh, Catherine Fitz will be speaking, Dr. Carol Rosen, who... Um, 
was one of the last professional acquaintances of, of Dr. Verder from Brown. Well, oh, she's been, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, very fascinating lady. Yeah. Um, I actually talked to her about two weeks ago and uh, on Skype, and, and I was under the impression that she was about 50 years old. <laughs> she, she said that she was in her 70s. Oh, <laughs> bless her heart. Totally. Yeah, she doesn't look like she's... <laughs> She doesn't look like she's in her 70s at all. Oh. Uh, but she'll be speaking. Uh, Mark McCandless will be speaking. Um, Michael Schratt. So a lot of good people uh, speaking. And that will be Saturday and Sunday, the last Saturday and Sunday in June. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Well, and people can get um, tickets and also... Um, tickets for video the conference yes. is going yeah, video to be streaming. yeah streamed uh, through video we hope yeah <laughs> barring barring technological glitches <laughs> yeah i hear you yeah. oh boy well and i want everybody to know that um our missing person that we all think so highly of um, he has just kind of gone underground yeah yeah and we all hope he's okay yes we certainly do Peter Lavinda yep so say a prayer for him and for George Ann oh thank you Joseph and there is a PayPal button on Joseph on George Ann's website <laughs> oh Joseph <laughs> bless your heart <laughs> oh um, goodness go to Giza G-I-Z-A deathstar.com work out Joseph's PayPal button and oh and, and I do have the new book up in the web store the, the, the new one yeah oh it's, I, 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 it's out so I put it up in the web store okay and that is her the Price 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 Medica, Medica and, and the, the Gen, Gen Age. Age oh Joseph, hmm. what explain what the Janus Age is? Well, I use it in a unique way just for the book. Um, Janus, of course, is the Roman god with two faces. Right. You know, one looking one direction, the other looking the other. Um, I use it as a symbolism in the book for a multitude of reasons. Um, one of which, of course, is that the Templars were accused of, of worshipping a head with two or three faces, interestingly enough. Oh. Um, Was that the Baphomet? Well, in some, yeah, in some versions of the Inquisition records, yes. Um, okay. But I also use it to mean that the book looks backward, way back in history, mm -hmm. and it looks forward in history and I also use it to mean that the book looks at the surface and then beneath it. Aha. Uh -huh. Very so. clever, my friend. Very clever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh well I wish you the huge success with your conference and Thank you. Oh yeah. And with your new book, Thrice Great Hermetica and the Janus Age. Get it. And get the tickets for the, um, what do you call it, Joseph, for the um, teleconference. Oh, the, the live streaming? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I've got a, a link on your, on your page at the Byte Show for the Secret Space program.org and you can go there and get your tickets so if you can't go in person be there anyway <laughs> yeah 
Okay, everybody. God bless you all for listening. Good night. Good night.